Welcome, today we have some chilling, most wanted cases. If you liked or found the video interesting, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe as there will be more in the future, Donald Alexander. Real name, Donald Alexander. Aliases, no known aliases. Wanted for. Chin. Missing since, unrevealed. Case. Details, 43-year-old Donald Alexander is a Royal Palm Beach, Florida resident accused of daughters. Their ages are 5, 7, and 10. His current whereabouts are unknown. Extra notes, this case was first featured on the November 3, 1993 episode along with David McLeod, Michael Benka, and Robert Fritsch. It was later reprofiled on the February 23, 1994 episode with Benny Franklin Miller replacing Benka's profile. It was excluded from the Amazon Prime and Filmrise episodes. Results, captured. It is not known if Alexander ever served time charges in Florida. However, in 2018, it was discovered that he was the owner of a store in Arkansas, living under the name Charles Smith. It was alleged that he placed hidden cameras in bathroom stalls at his store. In June, he was arrested for identity fraud, Michelle Abraham. Real name, Michelle Lee Abraham. Aliases, Michelle Armour, Lee Armour, Lisa Armour. Wanted for, abduction. Missing since, December 1996. Case. Details, Michelle Abraham and Ronald DiDonato are the parents of six-year-old Crystal. After they divorced, they fought over custody of her. During the court proceedings, Michelle accused Ronald of child molestation, among other things. The judge found no truth to the accusations and gave Ronald custody. He also gave Michelle some visitation rights. Michelle remarried and had another daughter, Jessica. On June 15, 1995, Ronald brought Crystal to New Haven, Michigan to spend the summer with Michelle as a part of their custody arrangement. She was supposed to bring Crystal to Ronald's home in Englewood, Florida on August 10. However, she never arrived. Shortly afterward on August 19, 15-month-old Jessica also vanished. Both are believed to have been abducted by Michelle, who is not the custodial parent of either of them. They have not been seen since. Michelle's second husband, Daniel, has since been granted a divorce and was given legal custody of Jessica. Michelle is wanted on kidnapping warrants in both Michigan and Florida. The police say there is good reason to believe that she poses a threat to Crystal and Jessica due to a history of drug and alcohol abuse. She was last known to be in Chicago in December 1996 using the alias Lisa Armour. Extra notes, this case first aired as a special bulletin on the April 3, 1998 episode. This case was excluded from the Filmrise release of the Robert Stack episodes. Results, captured. In June 1998, the FBI received a tip that Michelle, Crystal, and Jessica were living in Bryan, Ohio. On June 21, Michelle was arrested there and charged with parental kidnapping. Crystal and Jessica were found safe, they had been living in a home owned by Michelle's mother. They were reunited with Ronald and Daniel soon after. In March 1999, Michelle was acquitted of the kidnapping charges in Michigan. The judge agreed with her claim that she took Jessica because she feared Daniel's abuse. However, she still faced kidnapping charges in Florida in this case. In August, she pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three years probation. John Addis. Real name, John Patrick Addis. Aliases, John Edwards. Wanted for, murder. Missing since, August 1995. Case. Details, Sergeant Jim McCann and John Addis worked together as detectives for the Alaska State Police in the 1970s. At the time, he was married to his first wife Jody, who later divorced him because of domestic abuse. The couple lived in a cabin in the remote woods that didn't have running water or heat. Addis enjoyed hunting caribou in the Alaskan wilderness, but he was also a talented young detective with a mind for forensic science. He was so gifted that he instructed law enforcement from all over Alaska in crime scene analysis. At the time, no one knew that he was also physically abusive and controlling towards Jody. One day, Addis got into an argument with her. She said she wanted to leave him and jumped out of their car. He chased her down and threw her back into the truck. However, she was able to escape and was granted a divorce. After the divorce, Addis quickly remarried, and his personality turned from bad to worse. He abandoned his wilderness lifestyle, became a middle-class homemaker, and soon quit his job at the state patrol. He was extremely abusive towards his third wife. Then he abducted his four children from his first marriage and fled to Michigan, where he was involved in several robberies. He was eventually arrested and served one year in prison for parental child abduction.
Over the next decade, he jumped parole in Alaska and went throughout the United States posing as a fitness instructor, screenwriter, and novelist. He was a master at changing his identity, which helped him keep above the law. In 1995, he obtained another identity, John Edwards. During that same time, he met divorcee Joanne Albanese at a Las Vegas gym. He told her that he had no family and was never married. At first Joanne and John seemed very happy together. However, cracks soon emerged in their relationship. John paid for nothing and lived off of Joanne's earnings. Joanne and her friends noticed that John had a hair-trigger temper. He was also controlling and abusive. On August 19, 1995, Joanne vanished from her home in Las Vegas with Edwards. Authorities soon learned that Joanne was planning to turn down his marriage proposal and end their relationship the same day that she vanished. Three days later, her car was found abandoned in a canyon near Prescott, Arizona, but no other trace of her was found. Police discovered that a truck parked outside of Joanne's home belonged to John. Strangely, there was no record of the license plate. When they searched his home, they found a wallet that was duct taped shut. In it, they found Alaska identification for John Addis, which they learned was his real name. They suspected that he had been angered because Joanne was breaking up with him, so he killed her and then disposed of her body and car. On October 9, 1998, Joanne's remains were discovered over three years after she disappeared about a mile from where her car had been abandoned. Addis has been charged with Joanne's murder, but he remains at large. Extra notes, this case first aired on the April 19, 1996 episode as a special alert. It received a full segment in the July 30, 2001 episode. Addis was profiled on America's Most Wanted during the investigation and was documented on an episode of FBI, Criminal Pursuit after it was resolved. Results, Captured In November of 2002, investigators learned that Addis had been living in Guadalajara, Mexico, and had taken up with a 26-year-old woman named Laura Liliana Padilla. Laura's family told detectives that she had fallen in love with the handsome American, John Stone, and ran off with him in 1997. For the following nine years, her family and authorities in the United States feared that she might one day meet the same horrible fate as Joanne Albanese. Sadly, on October 18, 2006, those fears came true. Laura, along with her two children, who are believed to have been fathered by Addis, were found murdered in their home in Chiapas, Mexico. The children were ages four and seven. Mexican authorities found fake identification cards and documents belonging to John Addis in the home. The family had apparently been living there for some time. The family had been dead for several days when the bodies were discovered. The FBI has learned that John Addis, using the alias J. Charles Peterson, had most recently passed himself off as a Canadian expatriate while living in Chiapas. Addis had been making a living there, teaching English and tennis. Addis is believed to have checked into a hotel in Guatemala City, Guatemala, on October 14. That city is south of the Mexican-Guatemalan border, a couple of hours' drive from Chiapas, Mexico. Addis's body was found in the hotel room on the 16. His death was a suspected suicide pending further postmortem reports and is being investigated by police in Guatemala City. Postmortem results proved his death to be from a heart attack. Officials from the U.S. State Department assisted the Mexican and Guatemalan authorities in their investigation of Addis and his new family. Addis's true identity in death was proven through a postmortem fingerprint comparison. The case is now considered closed. Defala Al Salem. Real name, Defala Al Salem. Aliases, Defala Muhammad, Al Salem, Danny Abraham. Wanted for, abduction. Missing since, September 21, 1988. Case. Details, 36-year-old Defala Al Salem is a defector from the Jordanian army who came to the United States in April of 1980 and met Nancy Hardy of El Paso, Texas. The two came from different worlds. Nancy was a devout Christian who had spent almost all of her life in Texas. Defala was a Muslim and had told Nancy that he had come to the United States for a training exercise with the Jordanian army. Just one month after they met, the two married. In 1983, Nancy gave birth to a daughter that they named Shafa Lucinda, which means healing light. Starting at the age of one, Shafa began competing in beauty pageants. In 1988, she was a Texas state finalist in the Miss American Princess pageant. However, the marriage between Nancy and Defala began to disintegrate by 1987 because of Defala's alleged angry and violent behavior. He was very demanding and domineering towards Nancy. He didn't like when she did stuff on her own. He was verbally abusive and violent towards her in front of their friends. Nancy soon discovered that Defala had deserted the Jordanian army, he had earlier told her that he was merely on a leave in the U.S. Also, Defala began spending more time with Middle Eastern friends that appeared to be involved in extremist political activities. 
Finally in 1987, Nancy had enough. She and DeFalla separated, but they remained friendly, for the sake of their daughter. On September 19, 1988, when Nancy left town to attend to her late father's estate, DeFalla agreed to take Nancy to the airport and have the housekeeper watch Shafa while she was away. Before leaving, Shafa asked to go with her, however, she said no, because Shafa was in school. Around 1.30 a.m. the next day, DeFalla called Nancy's motel room to check on her. He called again later that morning and told her that he was going to take Shafa to school. Nancy became suspicious, she called DeFalla and the housekeeper several times, but never got an answer. She finally called Shafa's school, only to learn that she had been on the absent list that day. At 10.30 p.m. on September 21, she quickly returned home but found no trace of Shafa or DeFalla. She then discovered a tape-recorded message from DeFalla. He said that he was taking Shafa to Jordan for about three weeks. Soon after returning home, Nancy learned that DeFalla had dismissed their housekeeper and bought two one-way tickets to the Middle East. The local authorities and FBI investigated, but little could be done because DeFalla had left the country. Nancy began to search on her own for her husband and daughter. For four years, she received no new information regarding their whereabouts. In the meantime, she moved from El Paso to her hometown of Longview, Texas. She put up some of her inheritance as a reward, she hoped that someone would come forward with information about her daughter. Soon after the reward was posted, she finally received a lead. In January of 1992, Nancy returned to El Paso and met a man who claimed to be a Lebanese newspaper reporter. He had called her and said that he had important information regarding Shafa. Unbeknownst to the reporter, Nancy had a friend watch them from the parking lot. Her friend soon noticed a station wagon circling the restaurant, watching them closely. The car circled the restaurant for two hours, Nancy later learned that it belonged to a Lebanese couple. However, she could find no connection between the couple and Defala or the reporter. Meanwhile, the reporter told Nancy that Defala and Shafa were in Lebanon. He then outlined a complicated scheme to fly Nancy to the Middle East where she would be reunited with Shafa. He said that he needed $250,000 in cash for the plan to work. He said he also wanted $250,000 upon Shafa's safe return. Nancy was able to stall with the reporter long enough to get the FBI involved. Ten days later, she met him at an El Paso airport, she was shadowed by FBI agent Mike Pierce. The reporter claimed that he would arrange a phone call between Nancy and Shafa. He also claimed that he could get a document that would allow Shafa back into the United States. However, he said that he needed the money from her first. Nancy refused to give any money to him, now believing that he was a con artist. The FBI was unable to determine if the man was actually a reporter, but they believed that he knew nothing about Shafa or Defala's whereabouts. Three months later, in April of 1992, Nancy's close friends, Carolyn and Pat Mitchell, were driving in El Paso when they had a strange encounter. First, a woman wearing an Islamic headdress drove past them. Then, a man that they believed to be Defala passed them in a car right behind the first one. The Mitchells followed the car until it reached a house. The car then made a U-turn and quickly sped away. Nancy began staking out the house, she was accompanied by the same friend that had helped her earlier. A black Monte Carlo was parked in the driveway. Although several people were seen going in and out of the house, they did not see Defala. Eventually, they decided to leave, because it was around 2 a.m. However, as they left, they were intercepted by the same Monte Carlo that was parked in the driveway earlier. As the two drove away, the car started chasing them at high speeds. Fortunately, they were able to lose the car that was following them. Although they did not see Defala that night, Nancy believes that he is still in El Paso, she believes that his friends were trying to scare her away. Nancy is desperate for any information about Defala or Shafa. Extra Notes This case first aired on the January 5, 1994 episode. It was excluded from the FilmRise release of the Robert Stack episodes. Results Captured In January of 1999, Shafa Salem walked in the American Embassy in Stockholm, Sweden, and told them that she was a missing person in the United States. The FBI was soon contacted and arrangements were made to return her to the United States. On February 14, 1999, Nancy was joyously reunited with Shafa, now 15. Police at that time were trying to decide if they could charge Defala al-Salem, as he had shared custody of Shafa and didn't technically break any laws when he took her. It is unknown if he has ever been charged in the case, James and Lisa Albert. Real names, James and Lisa Albert. Aliases, none known. Wanted for, arson, fraud. Missing since, November 6, 1993. Case Details, Lisa Barnhart was one of seven sisters from a wealthy family. 
After graduating from college, she sold advertising for a newspaper in the Charleston, South Carolina area. When she was 22, she began dating a local businessman named James Albert, 15 years her senior. Her family liked him and believed that he treated her well. He apparently spared no expense in showing his affection towards her. However, her family could not understand how he made so much money with a company that sold steel storage drums. Lisa soon became part of James' lavish lifestyle. She traveled with him and hosted parties for his business friends. Eventually, they announced plans for a wedding. However, her family was stunned when she revealed his ideas about the guest list. He felt that they did not fit well with the society and the class of people that he was involved with. She was not comfortable with this, however, she changed her mind when he decided that they would go overseas to get married. On December 22, 1987, they were married at a castle in Edinburgh, Scotland. No family or friends were in attendance. Nearly two years passed, Lisa saw little of her family. She and James bought land on Kiowa Island, a fashionable retreat just off the coast of Charleston. They began building the house of their dreams. They said that they planned to move in before Christmas 1990. However, the dream house would never be occupied. On December 17, 1990, while they were out of town, it caught on fire. It, which was still under construction, was reduced to ashes in a matter of hours. According to Lisa's family, she was very upset about its loss. She told them that it had caught fire while they were visiting James' sick friend who lived out of town. After the fire, James and Lisa leased an elegant Charleston townhouse. According to her sisters, over the next few years, the magic seemed to drain from their marriage. He was apparently becoming very dominant and controlling over her. He would even listen in on her conversations with her sisters. Eventually, she told her sister, Nicole, that she was leaving him because she was afraid for her life. She said that he was emotionally and mentally abusive towards her. She feared that he would also become physically abusive. On July 31, 1993, two and a half years after the fire, Lisa finally left James. While he was away on business, she packed her bags and moved to an apartment of her own. According to her sisters, once she left, she returned to her old self. She was happy and excited about being able to spend more time with her family and friends. However, James soon began stalking and harassing her. He called and told her that he wanted to get back together with her. She told Nicole that she was never going to do so. Inexplicably, just one week later, Lisa was back living with James. Again, she seemed to withdraw from her family. Two months passed, with little contact. Then, on October 27, 1993, it was revealed that the fire was set by arsonists. Incredibly, the perpetrators claimed that they had been hired by James and Lisa to set it. Her family was shocked by the allegations. They were even more shocked to learn that she and James had fled the country on October 22. Her sisters did not believe that she was involved in the arson, they also feared that they would never hear from her again. However, the FBI believes that Lisa not only fled willingly with James, but also covered her getaway with a deceptive phone call. On the day they left, she called her place of employment and told them that she'd be sick and would not be in until the next week. After arriving in Paris, they then traveled to London. Their whereabouts have been unknown since November 6, 1993. Investigators soon discovered that James had lost his job in June 1990, six months before the fire. Apparently, bank loans earmarked for construction were diverted to pay for living expenses. This left James and Lisa, contractors, clamoring for payment. The funds were not there to pay for the specific contractors that were working on the house. Later in 1990, James approached one of the workmen and discussed the possibility of flooding the house from the second floor down in order to collect insurance money. The workman informed him that this would not be possible because there was no water hooked up to the house at that time. The next idea was to burn the house down to collect the insurance money. One of the workmen convicted in the case was interviewed for the broadcast. He claimed that his uncle had negotiated the arson for hire deal with James. His uncle told him that they were going to be paid $10,000 to burn the house down. On December 16, 1990, the workman and his uncle first picked up furniture from James and Lisa's apartment. They then drove to a storage facility to collect more of James and Lisa's possessions. The workman believes that Lisa was fully aware of the arson plot. According to him, she chose what was going to be burned in the fire and what wasn't. She and James apparently kept the expensive items but gave away cheaper items to be used. Lisa also gave the workman her car keys and asked him to park her car in the garage. She told him that they were going to North Carolina and claimed that they were visiting friends. The workman said that he and his uncle drove to Kiowa Island and moved James and Lisa's possessions into the house. Meanwhile, they headed out of town. The workman claimed that after unloading the possessions, he stayed the night at the house. 
At 4 p.m. the next morning, he woke up and set it on fire. As fire investigators searched through the rubble, they made some curious discoveries. It had no electricity, sewer, or plumbing of any kind. The toilets were sitting on the drain traps and not bolted down. There was no plumbing underneath the sinks or the cabinets. In spite of the peculiarities, the insurance company agreed to cover most of the losses. Over the next two years, payouts to James and Lisa topped $300,000 in addition to reimbursement of their construction loans. However, they felt that they were entitled to more and they filed suit to get it. On September 26, 1993, a month after they reconciled, James and his attorney attended a formal deposition. There, the workman slash arsonist was questioned by an attorney for the insurance company. At the deposition, he admitted to setting the fire at James and Lisa's direction. On October 22, five days before the story was released to the public, James and Lisa skipped town with roughly $80,000 in cash. They were both indicted on 25 counts each. If they're convicted, they both could spend the rest of their lives in prison. However, Lisa's family is still convinced that she is innocent. Investigators believe that she and James may have returned to the United States. Extra notes, this case first aired on the April 7, 1995 episode. Results, captured. In April 1996, James and Lisa traveled to the United States from Europe. She phoned her sister, Linda, from an Atlanta hotel and told her where they would be for the following hour. She also asked her to call the authorities. FBI agents arrested her and James outside of their hotel without incident. Four days later, he committed suicide in his jail cell. She faced charges of arson and fraud in South Carolina. It is not known how much time in prison she received. She has since been released. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more, like and subscribe to tell me you want more videos like this. But until we see again, stay safe.